Okay, so I'm just going to ask um, uh, these two young fellows here, Riley and Logan, to come on up. These guys have been great for the last month or so. Praise God. So uh, you guys are going to just turn around here and just stand right here. Stand right here. There he goes. Watch. That's fine. Okay. So, yeah, just stand right on that line on that carpet there. There you go. Okay. Yeah, maybe that might help. Thank you very much. So maybe get one microphone stand in front of them there, and then they can take turns in front of it. It's okay. Don't panic. They're very nervous, so that's okay. They've, I don't know if they've ever done anything like this before. So um, we're... Yeah, yeah. So, yes. So, um, so okay, stand there. Don't worry. I'll follow your uh, – I'm <laughs> very nervous. So, it's very – so, Lord, I just want to pray for these two young fellows. By the, by the power of God, I pray, Lord, that, Lord, that you will bless them right now, Father. Give them the peace of God. Lord, they just want to serve you, Lord, and they want to learn and grow, Father. They've been like sponges in the class, Father, and just growing and learning, and they're asking questions. They're very polite, Father, and, the Lord, they just want to learn more about you, Father. And, and, and Lord, and uh, they've also been uh, soaking up the music as well, Father. They want to learn music. So, Father, I pray that you will bless them in every endeavor that they do. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, these are the next generation. These are your people. These are your children, Father. They've accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, Father, and they want to serve you. So now, Father, I pray, Lord, that as we go forward, that, Lord, that, Father, that you will continue to bless them and that they will be protected and they will flourish, Lord, and they will get to know their Heavenly Father more and more every day. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So just so you know, my, my vision for these youth classes has always been very simple, the word and prayer. I always believed that the prayer of uh, prayer should be key to any child's life. I grew up, r I was raised to pray. You know, I was raised to, to pray by my parents. And I believe that children should know how to talk to God. I believe they should know that it's always in the name of Jesus. And I believe they should know how to read their Bible. Amen. And that's where it really all stems from. And any activity that we do, any coloring or singing or playing, it all stems from that. Amen. And these guys are really great at it. They're reading. They're very good at it, actually. So I just want to uh, encourage them. So now I'm going to just um, get into my message a little bit. My message is called Adorn the Doctrine of God. They're going to each say a couple of verses, and then I'm going to get them to sit down for the rest. But that's – but we're going to – because they're only new at this, right? So he's very, very, very – <laughs> Don't be nervous. That's okay. Just stand there, and I'll, I'll tell you what to do. That's all right. Praise God. So um, so this message is called Adorn the Doctrine of God. And it, it's not, it's, it's not going to sound as a, as a typical Christ, uh, Christmas message, but it is a Christmas message. So we're going to start with the big picture. And the big picture is John 1 and 1. So, Logan, for, could you perhaps tell us John 1 and 1? In the beginning was the world. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Praise God. So, um, stand on the line, and I'll give you your instructions, okay? Just follow my lead. Okay. Riley, your turn. What is John 1 and 14? John 1 and 14. Did you have a memory freeze there? Yeah. Okay, no problem. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. Okay. So, very good, guys. So, that's the big picture. The big picture is in the beginning was the word. Who's the word? Jesus. Who's the word? He's Jesus. So, Jesus is the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Are we recording back there? Okay, praise God. So Jesus is the word that was made flesh. He was God. He created everything, amen? He's the great creator. He's the great and awesome savior, amen? He's the one that is God. He is God. Okay, then, but it doesn't stop there. You read through all those verses, you get to verse 14, and it says that the, as Riley Excellently, re excellently recited, he said that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What is flesh? It's tangible. 
it's it's like hands and bones and blood, right? Flesh, right? Ouch, right, ouch, yeah. Kathy's saying ouch. <laughs> it, he could feel stuff, right? So that's the big picture. The word, Jesus Christ, became flesh. He lived among hi- us, and he, he, we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's exciting news. These people that wrote this gospel, that John the Apostle, he saw Jesus Christ. He touched Jesus Christ. He leaned upon his breast. He said, is, who is it that's going to betray you, Lord? Because he loved the Lord, and he couldn't imagine who could betray his Savior and Master. So I want to encourage you this morning. That's the big picture, but that doesn't stop at the big picture. There's a l- details to it, and those details matter. And I'm going to give you some details that we often overlook today. So I'm going to ask my two assistants here who are doing an excellent job. Uh, they're going to read for me Luke 2 and 1. They're going to recite that for me. Luke 2 and 1, Riley, can you uh, read that into the, can you recite that into the, if you need this, do you need this? In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole world shall be registered. Okay, thank you. And then, Logan, you're going to read for me Luke 2 and 3. What does it say? And all, and all went to be registered in each to his own town. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. So let's give them a hand. You guys can go sit down now. Thank you very much. You know, I'm just so excited about these guys. Uh, they're they're uh, a wonderful pair of brothers, and I just enjoyed teaching them so much all of this time, the past month and a half or so. And... Um, so these details, why are these verses in the Bible? In Luke chapter 2, in the Geneva Version, says, from verse 1 through 7, it says, And it came to pass, I'll just open it up here. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, says, And it came to pass in those days that there came a decree from Augustus Caesar that all the world should be taxed. This first taxing was made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Therefore went all to be taxed, every man to his own city. Some say registered, some say taxed. This is like a sign-up, right? Um, Therefore went all to be taxed, every man to his own city. Verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of a city called Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary that was given t- him to wife, which was with child. And it was so, and, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She was about to give birth, right? And she brought forth her first begotten son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a cratch, which is just an old English word for manger, and be- because there was no room for them in the inn. Okay, so uh, so why is it important that there was a decree from Augustus Caesar? He's a government guy. He's a guy in charge of things. But he wasn't a very godly person. He believed he was a god, actually. You know, ha- does anybody here know anything about C- August- Caesar Augustus? A little bit. Basically, he was a... Vi- uh, I read one article on Christian, uh, what was it called, Christian.about.com, and it was basically said he was like a benevolent dictator, okay, if there is such a thing. Basically, very generous and using his own resources and building his own armies, and, and they're like uh, p- uh, professional armies. And he, there's roads, you know, Rome is famous for its roads, you know, and uh, he encouraged uh, freedom of... Or, or thought and literature and, and that kind of stuff and philosophy. And he allowed the Jews to practice their religion. Now, that's all very important. God used that man to accomplish his purposes, right? And, it's, and so it is important to understand that sometimes the, the, the dreary things of life, the not-so-fun things of life, the things that seem like they're just routine or maybe they're very, very inconvenient could be used for God's glory. 
because I can tell you right now that Mary and Joseph were not looking forward to moving to Bethlehem. When they were, Joseph would have had his business in Nazareth. Mary was about to give birth. Who wants to go moving and traveling long distances when they're about to give birth? Hello? This was an inconvenience to them. I don't think they were thinking of Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Okay? But that was what God was going to accomplish through Caesar Augustus. So, you don't have to like the people that are in charge. But you can still honor them by the word of God. You can still pray for them. Okay? You can still, uh, you can still be a good citizen. All right? Because the Christmas story, the Christmas account, the historical fact of Jesus' birth would not have happened properly if it wasn't for that decree and if it wasn't for Mary and Joseph's obedience. Amen? So this Christmas season, you may feel like you're, you're stuck in some drab stuff or you've got to pay your taxes or you've, you've got to do some stuff you're not really looking forward to. Oh, really? Do I have to do that? Well, God might be in that. I think God is there. Amen? God is accomplishing his purposes through every aspect of your life with the things that you don't want to do, the things you don't feel like doing. God wants to do something through that. God uses governments, whether you like that or not. Okay? And he'll use ones that aren't so great either. But then he takes them down again. He brings them up and he brings them down. It's not our call, that's his. Hallelujah? You're still with me? Okay. So, this first taxing was made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Well, who is Quirinius? Anybody ever read about him? Basically, he was a guy that helped Augustus Caesar. He was like a... Um, he was like a, uh, what do you call it, like a consul or a, a, a guy that helped govern in the region of Syria. And according to what I read, basically was someone who helped assess property in the region of Judea. Okay? So he was a guy that was high up, like an aristocrat. And uh, what this does, why these guys are in the Bible, is because it helps to establish the historicity or the fact of Jesus' birth. These guys were both alive in history, you can read any history textbook that talks about these guys, Quirinius and Augustus Caesar, and they were both alive at 4 BC. They were both in their prime. They were both doing their thing. They were both doing what they were supposed to be doing when God had Jesus come into the world. When the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, these were details that mattered, and they mattered so much that they made it into Holy Scripture. And this inconvenient journey to Bethlehem made it into Scripture so that God's word could be fulfilled. He picked Mary, but Mary was nowhere near. Nowhere near Bethlehem. But he brought her there. Amen? So the next time you think, oh, I don't really want to do this, it's just the government thing anyway. Well, no, hold on a minute. God might be in it. Okay? So, so Joseph went up from Galilee out of a city called Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David. The city of David is Bethlehem, right? Which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now, Pastor Steve has done some uh, excellent teaching on the lineage of David, how both Mary and Joseph uh, both have this similar lineage from David, but through different sons of David, right? So uh, we know it's that Jesus. It's not some other Jesus. There's lots of Jesuses in, in uh, or Jesuses in Spain, right? Okay, but there's only one Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of Israel. Okay, praise God. So we know that we know that we know that, that their trek to, to Bethlehem not only fulfilled Scripture in Micah, but it, also, but it also established for sure that they really are of the house of David. Okay, it just further establishes that. Praise God. So Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, And thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, art little to be among the thousands of Judah, and yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that shall be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from the beginning and from everlasting. Okay, this is no ordinary prophecy. This cannot be just anybody being born in Bethlehem. All right? Bethlehem has to be the place. But not just everybody has been from the beginning. 
and not just any Bethlehem. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands. In other words, they're not a big town, not a big city. Okay, just a little place, seemingly insignificant. I mean, David was considered insignificant. He was just a little shepherd boy. And his own father thought, well, I'll get my most dashing-looking, strapping men, my, my, my most dashing sons all lined up for, for Samuel here. And uh, Samuel and the Spirit. See, God has, God, the, Samuel had the Spirit of God. And Samuel, so that therefore, by the Spirit of God, he knew there was another son. And he said, okay, these are guys are all great looking, but God says he's looking on the heart. So where's your other son? Where is he hiding? Come on now, bring him in. Praise God. Amen? So the seemingly insignificant one was the most significant of all because God made him king. God anointed him. And his name would forever live on because it would be through David that Jesus would be born. Amen? So all of these details are mad, are important. It's good to have the big picture. It's great to say that it's all about Jesus. It's all This season is about Jesus' birth so that he could grow up and that he could die and be raised again from the dead. That's all very good. But you've got to get into the details and really apply it to yourself and say, look, this Christmas season, maybe you don't have a whole lot of family. Maybe you're not into the whole big thing of all the decorating and all that. That's okay. But... Are you into the detail of God's word? Are you walking with your God and Savior? Are you remembering that Jesus actually gave up his place of glory in heaven to dwell among us? Amen? He put off all that stuff to clothe himself in flesh, to limit himself to flesh and blood for you. It's a gift to you and to me. So, Thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathra, that art little among to be among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. Who is the he? Jesus. And he shall that be ruler in Israel. This is not subtle, folks. He shall be ruler in Israel. And whose goings forth have been from the beginning. That has to be the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was... Wi with God, and the Word was God. Amen? So, uh, his, his goings forth have been from the beginning and from everlasting. In other words, before the beginning. Okay, get your mind around that. There was once upon a time a when there was no time. Okay, well, we can barely get our mind around that because we are bound by the confines of space and time. But the Word is not. The Word existed before time. He's from everlasting. And when time ends, he's still there. He's the everlasting. Amen. Praise God. So I want to encourage you today that this inconvenient journey made sure that the scripture was fulfilled perfectly. This inconvenience that Mary and Joseph had to go through, they had to, oh, I have to be registered now? Do I have to do it now? Timing couldn't have been worse. But actually, the timing was pretty good. But it didn't seem very nice at the time, right? Titus 2, verses 9 and 10. Okay? I'm just going to start linking some stuff together here. Uh, Let servants be subject to their masters and please them in all things, not answering again, neither pickers, that they show all good faithfulness, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Now, did we not just say that Christ is the reason for the season. We said that Jesus is the Savior, right? So God, our Savior, is Jesus Christ. Amen? So, praise God. So, if we are going to adorn the doctrine of God, then we should be showing all good faithfulness. And those, let's face it, we're not just subject to God in this world. We are subject to those that are ruling over us. We have to be good citizens. We have to do good jobs at work. We, ha we have employers. We have uh, bosses. We have uh, people that we work for. Or, we, you know, there's, there's people that are in charge of, of running the country, right? So there are other people in places of authority, and God has allowed them to be there. God placed them there. So we should not be pickers. What is that? Well, in the King James, it says purloiners. 
which I don't know if anybody knows that word, but basically it's like modern day extortion, okay? Or if the King James, uh, the Geneva says pickers, like pocket pickers, right? Okay, or thieves, basically. So we're to show all good faithfulness and adorn the doctrine of God. So we got to go right down to the very details. How are we living our lives today? How are we living today? Are we like Mary and Joseph? Are we able to just go through with the humdrum stuff or the stuff that we don't really want to go through with, but we know that it, it, you know, we don't know what the purpose is. God knows what the purpose is, right? It seems like it doesn't have a purpose at the time, but then God says, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So we're adorning the doctrine of God this, and our Savior. This, and that's what stood out to me. And that word adorn is cosmeo, to put in order, to arrange, to make ready, prepare. To ornament, to adorn, metaphorically speaking, to embellish with honor, to gain honor. So did you know that when you show all good faithfulness down to the very bottom of your daily life, that you are adorning the doctrine of God? You're actually embellishing it with honor. Every little detail of your life. I told you, it doesn't sound like a normal Christmas message, does it? But we need it. We need to do as Mary and Joseph did. They went through with the details that, that were, were very, very inconvenient, okay? I'm not saying that government's always right. No, they're not always right, okay? But what I'm trying, and I'm not here to, I'm not here, I don't work for the government, <laughs> okay? Uh, I, uh, I'm just your average citizen. But I do believe that we should be showing faithfulness in all areas of our life. Praise God. Because it's part of the Christmas story. It's part of the Christmas account. Hello? All right. We got the big picture, but do we have the details? Uh, Romans 13, 1 and 2 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. And the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive it to themselves condemnation. What? Does that just say that? It does. So, God expects us to follow, fo to follow through with the, keep the law, be good citizens, and have jobs and work at jobs and and not be pickers at those jobs or or pocket pickers, so to speak. Right? Show good faithfulness in all little details. It meant Joseph had to re relocate his business. Eventually, they settled down in Bethlehem. But the first night they were there, they had to look for space. And there was none at the inn. Okay, we know from Pastor Tracy's message that we don't even know if there was an innkeeper. <laughs> it wasn't. The innkeeper is not mentioned in Scripture. Okay, but we know there was an inn. And we know there was no room in that inn. So we know they had to stay somewhere where there was a manger. Okay, so eventually Joseph picked up his business there. And he was a carpenter. So he had to do his work. He had to move and do his work in the city of David. Praise God. So um, 2 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, the Lord, knoweth how, how, sorry, the Lord knoweth to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment under punishment. And uh, chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness to despise government... And who, which are bold and stand in their own conceit and fear not to speak evil of them that are in dignity. Whoa. Think about that. Okay? God is going to make a, us give an account of how we behave in this world. You let God deal with those that are in authority. He'll deal with that. You just follow your, you follow your conviction in the Holy Ghost. All right? Because, and part of that is being uh, is, is, is showing good faithfulness in every sphere of life. Pastor Steve is talking about being good stewards with money, you know, and having a job, and um, or, you know, doing investments or giving. That's part of being good faithful stewards. Hallelujah. Ephesians 5 14 to 21, wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and stand up from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Who here needs light today? 
Do you need light in the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. That's what that song says, you know, our God. Right? He shone in the darkness when he was born. Praise God. And therefore he saith, Awakest thou that sleepest, and stand up from the dead. This is Ephesians 5, verses 14 to 21. And stand up from the dead. Stand up. Are you going up? Are you going up this Christmas season? Are you registered? You know, I'm not talking about Augustus Caesar registration here. I'm talking about the heavenly registration now. The heavenly government. Because you see, the way you treat this government on this earth is likely how you're going to treat God. Think about it. He has a government too. Praise God. Right, think about it. So... It says here, stand up from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Take heed, therefore, that you walk circumspectly. What does that word mean? It's just ye old English for being aware of everything. You be aware of your surroundings. Hello. Pay attention. You know, don't stare into your phone all the time. Not as fools, but as wise. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the season, for the days are evil. And I don't know if you have that up there, 16, redeeming the time. The King James says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The Geneva says, redeeming the season for the days are evil. So it's time for us to buy back time, buy back the season. What is this season? This is a Christmas season. It's, it's we're the first day of winter, right? And we need to redeem it. We need to make use of it. We need to save our time, save our money, save our resources, and use them wisely. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, I'm not saying we should pack up and never buy any Christmas gifts or, or buy decorations. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that there's a gospel message to be preached. There is something greater than all this other fluff. There's nothing wrong with fluff. I mean, I helped the, the young ones build this tree up here, decorate this tree right there, and this one was also decorated. Praise God. So we got two trees here, and there's nothing wrong with them. But there's a gospel to be preached. We should be redeeming the season. Hallelujah. So, uh, the days are evil, and we see a lot of evil in the world today. Verse 17 says, Wherefore, be not unwise. Oh, he's telling us again. It's important. Be not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And sometimes people don't understand that God works through authorities. Okay? That is why the Christmas account happened, because God worked through authorities. It doesn't matter what the guy thinks about himself. He thinks he's all that in a bag of chips. That's fine. God will deal with that. God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. God dealt with Augustus Caesar. Well, Caesar Augustus, okay? But you follow through. Because you got to understand what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine. It's not drinking alcohol. It's getting drunk with it. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. But be fulfilled with the Spirit. I'd much rather have the Spirit of God. Amen? I mean, I don't drink any alcohol to be an example and because of my own personal beliefs. But the fact is that I have the Spirit. What do I need anything else for? Praise God. Speaking unto yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. That is part of how you can help to alleviate the tediousness of some of the things we go through. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Who knows? Maybe Mary and Joseph sang to the Lord on their way to Bethlehem. Okay? Because they were godly people. They loved the Lord. You saw um, the song that Mary gave, the song, the prayer that Mary gave. It's called the Magnificat or in, in Catholic literature. It's called that. But it's, it's uh, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. God my what? God, my Savior. Did you know that Mary needed a Savior? That's why she calls God her Savior. Amen? So maybe she was telling Joseph about this, and they were singing it together on the way to Bethlehem. Despite all the uncertainty of when is she going to give birth. Is she going to give birth on the middle of the road? Well, think about it, right? And uh, what about jo How is he going to continue his business? I guess he's going to have to make new contacts, right? I mean, when you're in business, you rely on local contacts, especially when there's no Internet. Jo uh, Brother Matthew is giving me the thumbs up back there because he's our networker. He likes to network with businesses, so it's important to network. And if you have to relocate, that means a lot of redoing work. You've got re to reestablish connections. 
Because you got to work, right? It's a detail of the Christmas story that we don't even think about half the time. Or at all. So it says here that uh, I got... Uh, Okay, yeah, verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. What is your heart singing of today? Are you singing to Jesus? Are you making melody in your heart to the Lord? I love to make melody to the Lord in my heart. I hope you do too. It doesn't matter how good you can sing. That's okay. You know, grab a tambourine and shake to the Lord. Shake the Lord, shake to the tambourine to the Lord. You can bang some drums for the Lord. Make a joyful noise. Learn to play piano. I got young Riley there who's really, yeah, he's giving me the fist pump. He's really stoked about the piano. I've got a little keyboard in there that I've been, I've been using from home that I've been using at the church for years. And uh, he's really taken a shining to it. And uh, he doesn't really, you know, he didn't really have any formal training before. And I don't even have any formal training on piano. But I'm teaching him what I know. And he's soaking it up. And uh, little and young Logan there, he seems to be interested in the bongos, so may, we may have a little thing going on there soon. We'll see. We'll just see how far it goes, eh? You never know. But it, the point is you're making melody in your heart to the Lord. And you're giving thanks always, not sometimes, but giving thanks always for all things unto God, even the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks Always for all things unto God, even the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that in the details, do you think Joseph and Mary were able to give thanks on their trip? I think so. I think so. Despite all of the inconvenience, are you able to give thanks to God on your trip? Are you able, when you're doing something, oh, you need to fill in a tax form or you need to go and get this license renewed. Yes, you need your licenses. Don't drive without a driver's license, okay? You're, you're not married unless you have a marriage license with witnesses, okay? You're not officially divorced without a divorce certificate, okay? It's a fact. And God respects and responds to or, or res recognizes marriage licenses and divorce certificates. Basic facts, folks. It's in the scriptures. You follow, okay? And we know that Mary and Joseph didn't have any personal, physical relationship with one another, even though they were married, until Jesus was born. So they were married. That, the marriage was an official covenant. Amen. It's all in the details, folks. <laughs> so, um, so we're giving thanks, and verse 21 says, Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. So we don't just submit to God, but we also submit to one another. So we should have an attitude of, of submitting to one another in the fear of God. We fear God. We respect him. We reverence God. Therefore, uh, you know, submit to your local pastor. Submit to Pastor Steve. And Pastor Steve will bless you back. I mean, he loves you. He loves you guys. So just help him out. Praise God. He needs your help. We all need help. I need help. Amen? We can't do this by ourselves. Submit to your local leadership, right? S families, submit to one another. Children, f submit to your parents. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, submit to the needs of your wives. Hello, right? We all need to submit one to another and to show that humility that none of us is greater than anybody else and that God is great, greatest of all. It comes back to verse 17 where it says you should understand what the will of the Lord is. And if we're not submitting to one another, we don't really understand that. We don't really understand the will of the Lord. You know, God uses governments that are questionable sometimes to punish his people. Like in Habakkuk, he talked about uh, God, is, you know, God is always in control. And Habakkuk complained that, that uh, Judah, well, Judah's not behaving properly. What are you going to do about it, God? And God said, well, I'm going to send the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk's like, what? They're even more wicked. Well, God said, you, you wouldn't believe it. I told you you wouldn't believe it, you know. We don't need to read it, but the point is that it's there, is that God will use governments and then take them down to accomplish his purposes. And God is a mysterious God. He's holy, he's pure, he's just, he's undefiled. And yet sometimes he uses governments that are not so great. Hello? What do you think we're in right now? What do you think the, our situation is? 
Okay? If you look at Western culture and Western governments, I'm not here to make a comment on it. I'm just saying that God is using these people too, believe it or not. Because if they, he wasn't, they wouldn't be in power. Okay? So now let's talk about Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith for a few minutes. He is the head of the heavenly government. Okay? And I knew that would get you excited. I know I've been saying some heavy stuff here, but Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. You should know this passage pretty well. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government is upon his shoulder. And he, he, he shall call his name Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the increase of his government and peace shall have none end. Everyone say, no end. Okay, that means that his government is the only one in all of history, heaven and earth's history, that will never end. You know, Augustus Caesar and Quirinius, his uh, right-hand man there, those guys, they ended. Their government ended. The Roman Empire ended. Right? Uh, you know, no government on earth is eternal. God uses them for his eternal purposes, though, because the birth of Jesus Christ has a lasting impact, doesn't it? Because he died and rose again. It has eternal impact. Ha all of history hinges on the birth of Jesus Christ. It's really all surrounded. It, I mean, the timelines are built around that birth, isn't it? Okay? It's all around that time of 4 B.C. So unto us a child is born, right? Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Verse 7 says, The increase of his government and peace shall have none end. He shall sit upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. To do what? To order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Hallelujah. God's own fervor, God's own conviction, God's own strength. He's going to perform this. And we know that Jesus is that child. That he was born a child and he was given the government. And the government is on his shoulders to this day. Amen? He is in charge of the heavenly government. Are you registered with the heavenly government? Are you registered with them? We know we have to be registered with our government. The Canadian government requires us to be registered. And we, it requires us to pay our taxes. And we have to let them know whether we're what, what our marital status is. All that kind of stuff. All the boring stuff. God expects you to do it. Hello? Okay. It's still a Christmas message. Don't worry. <laughs> but the point is that, that, that yours should be registered with the heavenly government. Amen? And if you know anybody who isn't, you should ask them with one of the, our, our cards there that has the finger pointing up saying, are you registered? Are you going up? Because Jesus is the head of the heavenly government. He's the king. Praise God. Praise God. Are you still all with me there? Okay. All right. Praise God. All righty. And there are times when God gives us special instructions too. Special instructions. Matthew 2, verses 10 to 12 says, And when they saw the star, this is the wise men, who are like astronomers, they rejoiced with an exceeding great joy. Yes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We found the star. We found it. We've been traveling for like two years. Well, it's a long journey, right? But it, it probably appeared at the time of his birth. So they went into the house. Okay, it's not a manger. It's a house. They went into the house and found the babe with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him and opened their treasures and presented unto him gifts, even gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These are faithful stewards, people. These people were giving their uh, out-of-nation gifts. These are like uh, international treasures. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, absolutely. They're in a house, and obviously he's affording this house, isn't he? He's not living for free. How did he get that house? He obviously bought it with his new business. And logically, if he was a carpenter, we know he was, that Jesus was the son of a carpenter. We know that from two verses. 
So he obviously was a carpenter by trade. He must have been doing it. He, either he built it himself or he bought it. One of those two options. It's stewardship. The details, the humdrum, the stuff that we don't really look forward to, it, but we have to do it. But you should enjoy it because God gave it to you as a gift. Stewardship is a gift, especially at Christmas. Uh, they saw the young child, and these guys are blessing them, and they needed the they needed the resources anyways. You know, th this family was blessed by the resources of these wise men. We don't know how many there were. There could have been 50 of them. <laughs> Maybe they needed a bigger house after the gifts were dropped off. <laughs> Maybe they needed a, a storage facility afterwards, right? Joseph said, ah, I'm glad I have my tools ready because I need more storage space now. <laughs> Who knows how many gifts they got, uh, how much the total was, right? But the point is that God knows and that it's faithful stewardship. But what happened afterwards? You know, Herod told them to come back and see him. He is a king. But it, what does it say in verse 12? After they were warned of God in a dream that they should not go again to Herod, they returned to their, into their country another way. In other words, Herod meant to harm the child, which is the opposite of a duty of a king. Okay, kings aren't meant to do that. And these wise men were not in Herod's jurisdiction. They were from a different country. So God said, you can bypass that because I'm God. And he's going to harm this child, which I don't want. So you go home. Praise God. So this Christmas season, I want to encourage you that the details do matter. Amen. So I'm just going to read this one more time here for you. And uh, Luke 2, it says that... Uh, and it, so it was while they were there that the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her first begotten son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a cratch or a manger. And because there was no room for them in the inn. Amen. And, uh, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch by night over their flock and lo the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone about them and they were sore afraid then the angel said unto them be not afraid for behold I bring you glad tidings of great joy that shall be to all the people that is that unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior that is Christ the Lord it wasn't they were only able to say that because of what how God orchestrated everything all the details so God bless you. I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Steve a few minutes early here. And thank you for listening.